Welcome to the Dr. and Mrs. Curry podcast, where the emphasis is on parenting related matters. My name is Dr. Joshua John Curry, and with me is my better half, Mrs. Cartrice Ellen Curry. Today's episode will concentrate on instability, but expanding. We will focus on circumstances parents find themselves engaged in that involves them expanding their families by welcoming additional children into the world, even though there is awareness that timing may not be appropriate and of course, this is from an all-inclusive manner. We're going to jump right in with the subtopic of why do we as a culture or as a society have a child and then more and more children, reaching five, six, seven children in a family or within the household, even though we know we cannot take care of those children adequately. We know that we don't have the timing or the resources to appropriately tend to each of those children on that particular level. So what I wanted to toss to you, why is it that this happens throughout the United States of America? You know, I think every, uh, every person's reasoning for having a child is different, but I've noticed that in some instances, some people believe that having multiple children is either one part of their religion or two, some people, as much as I hate to say it, they have multiple children for financial reasons. Um, every family is different. Every family makeup is different. And and at least like as a culture now, it's become this, in my opinion, this type of fad to have multiple children. Like you see it on TV shows there, there's so many and counting or whoever's family and 20, like there's just these large families and some people like the idea of that, I believe. And I believe some people believe that as a society, you should have multiple kids. I think that honestly, you should, before you have more children, you should sit down and take a self-survey and decide if this is something you truly, truly believe you can do and you truly, truly have enough love to give to more than you already currently have. Like it's not, having kids is not an easy feat. You don't just have them and then that's it, they're there. It's, it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of patience and a lot of communication with your children, with your partner. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. So if you truly believe that you don't have the love, which is number one and most important, and the energy to be able to give to multiple children, to 12 kids, to five kids, to 19 kids, to however how many you already have or that you already have in your home, then you should most definitely not be having additional ones. I know a lot of people come from, and it's not more so like, our generation, it's older generations, they come from large families. So some of them think that that is there were some people think that large families are normal because they have so many in their family. But you also have to take into consideration the times and take into consideration your financial means, your ability to give love and support and energy to all of those children that are in your home. You made mentioning of, uh, of course, parenthood being a lot of work. And I'm just, as you were talking about that, I'm listening here intently. And I'm also thinking about what, just what I have to do individually uh, later today. After we're done with this recording, we're going to go through some editing. I have a couple of more individual counseling sessions scheduled this afternoon. I have a uh, multi-organizational meeting that I'm going to be facilitating with a different organization that uh, that's working alongside of Dr. Curry and Associates. As soon as all that's over, in addition to documentation I have to take care of this evening, I have to take our 14-year-old daughter to her basketball practice with her high school. What's happening there is, with this practice not being as extensive as her other ones, I'm going to remain in the parking lot of her school. So while I'm waiting on our daughter, I'm going to go vacuum out my automobile and then return back and just sit there and wait. So that's going to be about a 15-minute trip to her school, just a one-hour practice to wrap up Friday, a 15-minute trip back. That's just an hour and a half as far as being dedicated towards one particular thing. I'm going to go grab her, her favorite meal. So what I'm saying there is there's going to be some discussions. So that's just two out of 24 hours, which is actually quite a bit as far as our normal. That's just two out of 24 hours with one child in particular. Later this evening, after everyone's shut down for the evening, everyone's showered, everyone's fed, and we're just winding down, we have our four-year-old son. I'll probably play some sort of uh, games with him, whatever he decides to come up, whether that's come up with, whether that's with uh, dinosaurs, whether that's with police cars, 
uh, race cars, whatever he decides. So that's going to be an hour, hour and a half with him alone. He may want to get involved with some sort of play fighting, some sort of pillow fighting, whatever he comes up with. So what I'm doing here is I'll share this with other parents and I'll give them one of our more extensive days where perhaps we're spending a certain activity could cost us four, five, six hours with one child alone. So we have our eight hours of sleep, six hours with one child. That's already 14 hours out of the day. That's already took, that's already accounted for. So what I'll do here with parents, I'll say, it's tough there with just two. And my wife and I, we're, we've been blessed to have been together and we can work together, work off of each other just with two. So I'll ask, how does this work with you as far as five, six, seven, eight, sometimes even north of 10 children within one household. So what I'm doing here is obviously these children are here, so all we can do is make adjustments. I'm trying to get people in a position to understand that, like you just mentioned, there is a lot of work and there's a lot of dedication, a lot of sacrifice that goes into each day as far as raising children and being there for them to support them and make certain that they know that they are important and that they're loved unconditionally. Before I dive into what I had planned for us, I wanted to share something. I was uh, in conversation with another parent and she made mentioning of being on the verge of, she's in a very, very solid, very committed relationship. She has three children of her own. She was talking about introducing a fourth child at some point in the near future. She has a plan. She plans on doing this during the next two to four years, but she made a comment. She talked about it being very important, and this is coming from a woman's perspective. She knows that I'm all about women empowerment. She knows that our company is all about the empowerment of women, the support of women, the support of mothers, and matters along those lines. But she had shared with me that she's always felt this though that when it comes to a woman giving birth, it should be, if the man is around, it should be a collective decision as far as um, when birth control stops. What the, what happens as far as when a pregnancy takes place? and things uh, along that particular path. I thought that was very powerful, particularly coming from a woman, particularly in this case, she is no longer with the father of her children, but he, at least he is around. But when she made that comment, I wanted to uh, present it to you through this particular platform as far as a woman's pregnant. And of course, it's her body, it's her rights, whatever she wants to do. But I have met women that say that I'm going to do this, either continue with the child, continue with the birth, the pregnancy, or move towards abortion. I'm going to do this on my own without any input from the male, from the father, or from whomever. I'm going to make my decision. That's what it's going to be. From your standpoint, when it comes to whether we're talking about the discontinuation of birth control, whether we're talking about an unplanned, un unsuspected, unexpected pregnancy, what should take place? And of course, everyone's circumstances are different. Everyone's dynamic is different. But what should take place? Should that be a decision or a conversation or a dialogue that's, happened, that's happening as far as both parties, the man and the woman? You know, I think, honestly, it should be a conversation that's had amongst them because you both, ultimately, if it was like an accidental pregnancy, either way it goes, in my opinion, there's truly no such thing as an accidental pregnancy because there are so many different forms of contraceptive out there to prevent that from happening. So just as much as you as a woman made a decision not to be on some form of birth control, you also made the decision and he as the man also made the decision not to use a condom. So both you both made a decision to take the risk of becoming pregnant. But I believe that that is a conversation that should be had between the two of you as grown adults. You guys should sit down and you should discuss it. You guys should discuss, okay, well, I don't believe in this or I'm not comfortable doing this. So I'm going to have go through the full term and whatever the next steps will be after that. I think that you as a woman should take in his opinion and his consideration. And I think for me, one of the biggest things that I think a lot of people do in general, men and women do, is that they don't actually listen to what someone is telling them. A lot of times I think people like to, they hear what they're saying, but they're not actually listening to it. So they can hear someone tell them, well, I don't want kids, but in their mind, they're putting it, oh, well, once, it's, once the child is here, he'll change his mind or she'll change her mind. 
that's not the way it is. If someone tells you something, you need to listen to it and accept it for what they are telling you in that moment. Because what happens is a lot of people have that conversation where one, one person in it that's involved is saying they don't want to have children. And the other one is saying, well, I'm going to have the baby. But then that person that had the baby gets mad and has an issue and an attitude with the person that's not involved. But they told you that they don't want children. So you inadvertently of yourself are taking it upon yourself to have this child by yourself. And you can't catch an attitude with that person because they already told you that that's not what they planned. That's not what they want. But it is a conversation that needs to be had prior to either stopping birth control or choosing not to use condoms because once neither one of those are in place and you become pregnant, you become with child and you and this gentleman have to have this conversation. If you guys haven't had this conversation beforehand, then you're kind of stuck in a situation where you either go one way and no offense to anyone, have an abortion, or you go the other way and give the child up for adoption or the middle route and keep it. But inadvertently, if you don't have the conversation beforehand, there's going to be someone that's not happy either which way it goes. What I would like to do here is I would like to present someone to you. I'm going to present a 34-year-old African-American woman. She's single. She has four children. Unfortunately, each of these four children, they've, uh, they're in custody of the state uh, through involvement with Child Protective Services. This woman was dating a gentleman, uh, a mutual relationship. This, uh, this relationship just lasted about, about two and a half, three months. They both realized that perhaps there isn't anything here romantically, but we're going to move away as far as cordially. So they no longer see each other face to face. This gentleman actually takes a job in a different state, so he relocates. They've still corresponded periodically through uh, teleconferencing and things of that nature, but they haven't seen each other face to face in uh, several months. They only see each other pretty much from the chest up, from the shoulders up. What happens here is two and a half months after this gentleman relocates, the woman finds out that she's pregnant. She just went for a, a routine medical procedure. Blood work was done and she found out that she was approximately uh, two months pregnant. So she shared this with me. So uh, whenever anyone asks me or anyone tells me that they are pregnant, I'll say, well, first of all, is this, because everyone's situation is different. Is this good news or is this bad news? She said, this is great news. So I say to her, I say to her, who's a lucky gentleman? Because according to my, uh, my documentation, I have no memory of you and I discussing the lucky gentleman. She told me that there was a person that she was dating uh, off and on pretty much a, a sexual relationship. It was just a, in lamest terms, a friends with benefits type relationship. This gentleman is no longer living in the state. He had relocated pretty much to the uh, Midwestern area of the state, of the uh, country. So I'll say, okay, uh, so what's gonna happen there logistically as far as him being involved? Because it sounds like this is a good guy with a great head on his shoulders with him being career oriented and things like that. So she shares with me, I don't know. So I'll say, well, we, uh, we have a baby that's gonna be arriving here in the next five and a half months or so. So we have to get things figured out. So she says, no, Dr. Curry, I really don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know uh, when I'm going to tell them or if I'm going to tell them. So now we're talking about, I understand the when. Of course, I'm not making the recommendation to uh, have that discussion as soon as we're done or tonight or this weekend, but I would encourage the, uh, the when, not the if. So when she says, I'm not sure if I'm going to tell this individual. So now here's where I'm providing some psychoeducation and other interventions to at least get this woman in a position to understand the severity of all parties being involved with decision making, and particularly if we're moving forward with the uh, pregnancy and the birth of this child, our children deserve to have mother and father around if both are able and willing to do so. So she uh, so time goes by. So whenever I speak with this woman, of course she knows it's coming. I say, how did the discussion go? I'm pretty much assuming that the discussion was made. It was had. So she'll share with me that I haven't told him yet. So now we fast forward. A significant amount of time is going by. This woman is now barely above eight months pregnant. So now we're making arrangements. She's already 
made arrangements as far as getting her home together to accommodate, to welcome this child into the world. She still has not told the gentleman that uh, this kid could be his. And she shared with me that this was the only gentleman she was intimate with during that particular time period. So what I'm saying here throughout the months, and of course we're getting more closer to crunch time, I'm saying that I would like for us to think, would this be unfair to him for him to learn that he has a six month old, a uh, one year old, a two year old, a three year old child out there that he wasn't involved in. He never had the opportunity to be engaged with this child if it is his during that point of that baby's life. She told me, here's a plan. She said, my plan is uh, he does have family in the local area. She said that he is family oriented and there will be a time in which he will be back in the area. She told me that her plan is I'm just going to wait until he reaches out to me when he's back in the area. So here's what I tossed at him, at her. I said, okay, but what if he never reaches back out to you? Not because there's any disdain between you and him. I understand that the, the friends with benefits situation arrangement came to an end and it was mutual. There nothing of significance happened. I said, what if he just met his better half yesterday? And now they're moving forward with doing whatever. He's making these arrangements with the understanding that he doesn't have any children out there. This is a this is a uh, this is a male in his mid to late thirties. He doesn't have any children that he's aware of. And what I do there is I harp on that he's aware of. So he could be making decisions as a single male with no responsibilities as far as fatherhood. When all of the while that there is a child out there that may be his. So what's happening here is she said that she understands that she'll let him go and make any arrangements there. She's not asking for anything. So I'll bring it back to you may be okay financially, but we have to dive into what is best for that child. Is this man presenting any vices that could be problematical to the child? The answer is no. But we got to dive into is it fair to the man? Because he he again is making decisions in which He's doing these, he's engaged with this form of decision making as though he doesn't have any responsibilities out there. But she is content with just moving forward and just waiting for this child, for this man to pop back into the area. So I'll share with her that I've known people who've moved overseas, who've met their better halves and moved overseas. And there's not many people, but I've known people who have done that, who've left the United States of America, relocated, obtained citizenship in different countries. I said, what if this man does that, particularly with the form of within his career management field, he will be involved with international operations, so to speak. So what if he meets someone from Germany, from one of the Oriental nations, from the Middle East, from, uh, from Great Britain, one of those other foreign areas? He meets someone, falls in love with her, travels to go meet her family, falls in love with the culture, falls in love with that geographical area and just relocates. So now he's buried roots in a different in a different country, in a foreign country. And then all the while there's a child that he learns about three, four, five, seven years later. If you were to speak, if you were able to speak with that person, with that woman that I just presented, what would you say to her with her being pretty much a little past eight months pregnant and about to welcome a child into this world here in the next few weeks or so? And she hasn't told this man about it yet. You know, I would tell her that uh, the thing that comes to mind the most is when you're when you're younger and throughout your life, you you hear the this very common saying that um, do unto others as you want done unto you. Um, basically, all it boils down to is would you like someone to keep important, life changing information from you? Like that's it's not fair. That's not right because at some point in time you could. God forbid you fall on hard times and now all of a sudden you need assistance from him. Like now all of a sudden you're going to go and file court paperwork and have him serve court documents because for something that he doesn't even know exists. And you could be throwing a big meteor into his life, into his family when it's 10 years down the line and all of a sudden you need help or assistance or your child starts asking about their dad and you now you have to find this person and tell this person that, hey, I had a child by you 10 years ago. And even though we did have some communication at the beginning of the pregnancy, I never told you. That can cause resentment and that can cause issues for 
your child down the line, like, or even God forbid that there's a health issue, a health risk that comes up and your child needs him, his biological father to be tested for something. But now you can't do that because you never told him that he had a kid. And if he has sibling, he ends up having siblings because his dad ends up having kids with his, with his person that he falls for, then they can't be tested either, which then puts you in another hard spot dealing with something that it wouldn't even be necessary. I know it's not an easy conversation to have. It's not, it's not going to be, it most likely won't be pleasant, but it's just something that has to be done. You have to have that simple conversation. And in the middle of telling him, Hey, I, last time we were together, I got pregnant. Um, I know I haven't told you for months. I do apologize for that, but I wasn't sure how you would take it but I am having the baby. And if you would like to be involved, they're more than welcome to be involved. You know, it's just little considerations like that. It's important to have that conversation because not only do you deserve to have it, your child deserves for you to have it and he deserves for you to have it. It's not fair to do that. And it's like I said at the beginning, you know, like you've heard throughout your life, do unto others as you would do unto your, like as you would like done unto you. You wouldn't want someone keeping something like that from you. So it's not fair to do that to the, to him. There was a time in which we discussed this. She was probably around six months pregnant. And like I mentioned, this is something she knows it's coming up whenever she and I get together. And there was a time she asked me, she said, hypothetically, if this for you, how would you handle it? So I tossed at her, I said, okay, I'm going to try to think because if I'm 38 years old, I'm 38 years old now, but I said, if I'm 38 years old and I'm not married and I don't have children, I will be a different version of myself. So that means my decision making would be different. I wouldn't be this version of myself. So here's what I tossed at her. I said, oh, here I am, 38 years old, no responsibilities as far as family. I'm at a gas station. I'm at a gas station. I'm pulling into pump seven. There's another motorist who sees me pulling in a pump seven. This motorist cuts me off and takes pump seven. Now, as a married man, and I'm using, and I told her I'm using this scenario because it's happened to me recently. As a married man with children, I say, you know what, you got it. It's no big deal. I'm going to loop around here and go to pump 11. We're going to pump my gas and I'm going to just leave. No harm, no foul. I'm not even thinking about that person. I might just say to myself, that person has some things that probably should be addressed, but they're not a thought in my mind because I have more important things to worry about. And most importantly, I want to go home to my family. So what I share with her is how would I handle that if I'm 38 years old, no wife, no children? Do I let that slide? Or do I handle it the same way? I would like to assume I would. But now we're talking about someone with no responsibilities. Do I get out and challenge this person verbally? Of course, I, I would assume that I wouldn't just get out and get into a physical altercation over a gas pump, especially because there's other gas pumps available. And if there isn't, there will be here in the next 90 seconds or so. So I'll say to her, do I handle that situation differently? Do I get into a verbal altercation, which could turn physical? So now what I'm doing here, I'm spending the evening in the county jail over a gas pump because I'm not this version of myself where I'm saying, you know what, I just wanna go home, enjoy some uh, peaceful, relaxing time with my family. So me being that version of myself, I don't have any responsibilities. I couldn't say how I would, I would handle that situation. I would hope I would do it pro-socially. I would do it maturely. But now we're talking hypothetically again because I'm not that version of myself. So now I'm changing things up a little bit. Me knowing that I have a child on my way if it was me. I would like to assume that I would handle it the same way that, hey, you know what? I got a child that's coming here in the next three months or so. I'm going to just, I'm going to be a first time father I want to have a good first impression. I would like to be there. I would like to not be in the county jail over a physical altercation over something that took place at a gas pump. So maybe I'll tell myself those things. So what I, I was sharing with her is just bringing things back to her. I was saying, again, this person, when you know you're a father, you become a different version of yourself. So he could be this version of himself as a single man, unmarried, no children he could engage in various forms of decision-making. So what I did with her is, I say that same situation. If someone cut him off at a gas pump, he's having a horrible day. He's already fuming. His blood's been boiling all day. 
Does he get out of his automobile and get into a physical altercation, which could lead to law enforcement being called and him spending the uh, evening in the county jail? Or even worse, what if he puts this person into a coma? What if this person passes away? So now we're facing manslaughter charges. What I do with a lot of clients, I take things to a, a little bit of an extreme, but I say, are they realistic? Regardless of how, how minuscule the likelihood of it happening is, it's still realistic. But we have certain information about our surroundings, about our livelihood, about our welfare, about what's happening in our lives. We become a different version of ourselves. But she did share with me, despite all of that, she was still going to persist forward with not telling this gentleman, but hopefully uh, that changes here. I mean, we're already, like I mentioned, we're already pretty much close to the due date. And according to what she told me, that this gentleman uh, still is totally unaware. I just told her, especially with you and him being former friends with benefits, he's engaging in certain activities. He's making certain decisions as though he is an unmarried man without any children, because in his mind, that is what he is without any children on the way. Because in his mind, that's his reality. I just told her to share that. And just remember that, like you had just mentioned, whenever you are ready to uh, disclose this information, or if you do have a change of heart, or if there is some sort of medical issue where the biological father needs to be tested for whatever reason, of course, hopefully that doesn't happen. But now you may have to try to track someone down who doesn't have any social media, who perhaps relocated to, uh, to a different state, who is perhaps even living off the grid who we've been is relocated overseas. Now you may have to spend a lot of time trying to track someone down in a situation or, or under circumstances in which there isn't much time to track someone down. So hopefully uh, she uses that, that type of information or those type of thoughts and feelings and make the right decision for herself, for the man, and most importantly, for the child. Now, speaking of which, I wanted to transition into this particular topic, this was supposed to be our predominant topic. We're talking about instability, but expanding. I wanted to toss at you another woman. This woman here, we, we have three children. She's a single woman, a 29-year-old Caucasian woman. She has unfortunate involvement with Child Protective Services. She has three children herself. Unfortunately, they were all, she had, they were all uh, placed in state custody. She's already making plans on expanding her family very uh very wonderful person just made just fortunately had some very horrible things happen to her which caused her to uh self-medicate which led to a life of active addiction one thing that she and i discuss very frequently i say you're still young enough you've been doing a great job as far as working towards sustained active recovery your body from a physiological from a biological from a uh medical standpoint, it's going through positive transformations back to the version of itself prior to the possible damage that was done during your days of uh, active addiction, chemical abuse. She talks about having, she wants one more child. She says she always wanted four children, which is fine. If we have the love to do so, if we have the resources to do so, that's totally fine. But at this particular point, she is still, from a technical standpoint, she is unemployed. She is homeless. She doesn't have access to appropriate transportation. And like I mentioned, her three children are in state custody, living in three different locations across two different counties. But she is still very set on having another child now. That goes back to the instability, but expanding. She still have uh, those intentions. What I would propose to her, I would say, let's give it another year or so, perhaps even three. Most importantly, let your body continue recovering from the damage that was done during active addiction because we want our children to have the best opportunities out there. We don't want our children to be hindered physically, uh, neurologically, neurocognitively, intellectually because of damage that was done during chemical abuse. So what I say here is in addition to allowing your body to recover, let's get our children back out of state custody. Let's get employed. Let's get a career started. Let's get some roots buried within a particular career management field. Let's get you a home that's not a part of a program that can be taken away from you because during the uh, three years I've been working with her, she has lost every home because of some sort of minuscule, but of course, still significant violation of programmatic policies. She lost uh, the assistance of the programming and subsequently lost those homes. 
So I like to make the recommendation of also, let's get a home that's not attached to a program so it's yours, so someone can't come and take it away because you had over too many guests, because music was loud, because you, which we don't want to happen, because you produced a positive urine screening or because you missed one gathering. Let's get away from those obligations and just have a home that's yours. I talk about, let's get an, a reliable automobile and then perhaps most importantly, meet someone who's not just an associate, that's not just a friend with benefits, but someone who loves you unconditionally, someone who will love your children that you already have unconditionally and treat them as though they are his. Let's have that family unit, that family unit if we can. But she is still, she is still very uh, committed towards expanding her family, even though she is in the process of, uh, of, couch search, of couch surfing. She is still unemployed. She is still unfortunately involved with particular matters to support herself financially, which could potentially put her in subsequent problems with Child Protective Services, as well as the criminal justice system simultaneously. What I wanted to toss at you, why do people expand their families under such circumstances? Homelessness, unemployment, lack of uh, transportation, or at least access to transportation, even if it's public transportation, having children living in different places, but we're still adding on to that plate of parenthood. Why does this happen? I think some people do it because they, they feel like having a child is that one person that's going to love them unconditionally no matter what no matter what they do what happens what circumstances they're in what what job they have no matter what that having a baby is that one person in the whole world that's going to love you unconditionally no matter your flaws or or your goals and your achievements the thing to always look in the thing to always consider when a child is being brought into being brought into this world is, in my opinion, the two biggest things are, do you have enough in you to love that child unconditionally just as much as they are going to love you unconditionally? And do you have the means to support that child so that way they feel safe and secure every day, every night that they are with you? You know, safety and security and love are the main things for kids, especially at certain at those younger ages and having that that safety, the security, the stability, the love that helps them form and develop into who they're going to be as teenagers and adults and stuff like that. So if you cannot provide unconditional love, no nonstop, no matter what, no matter what circumstances you're in and you can't provide safety, security, and stability, then I think as an adult, you need to seriously say, okay, this is not the time to do this. I, I should not do this to a child right now. I should not have a child right now because I cannot keep them safe. I, can, I don't have it in me at this moment to give them unconditional love while I'm still fighting this vice or I'm still going through this. And it's okay to not be able to do it at this moment. It's okay to need to wait a little longer. I think a lot of people put timelines on themselves as far as when they can and can't have kids. And if they don't have it by this time, they haven't had the child by this time, that it's never going to happen and all of this. But that's not true. There are people that are 50 years old having kids right now. And it, it just, there, it is still possible to have kids when, even if you are a little bit older and you're just trying and you finally have everything the way you want it and it needs to be for them to feel love and feel safe. You know, with you mentioning about the uh, time, I get asked very frequently, hey, Dr. Kerr, when are you and your wife going to have your third? And I'll say, that would be great. But what I would like to do, of course, God willing, I would like for the timing to be, to be appropriate. You know, we have our share, which a lot of people know I talk I talk a lot about our family. I say, well, we, uh, I would like to uh, get our business, of course, moving forward, just keeping building upon that foundation. I would like to uh, make certain that our daughter has a sufficient transition into high school. I would talk about our son. He's in the process of not only going into uh, pre-kindergarten, but also uh, here in the near future, he's going to be transitioning into elementary school. And there's other things that's taking place within our family dynamic, within our household dynamic. I would say before we, I would like to have those things taken care of. And then we, uh, you know, sit down with my wife and we have a discussion as far as, okay, when would be, 
the appropriate time. So it doesn't have to uh, be right now. If that time arrives, that would be wonderful. If the time doesn't arrive, then that's what it is too. We still have a very wonderful family. So I would just talk about theirs. We don't have to be in a rush to shoot for three and then shoot for four and then shoot for five and things like that. Let's I say, I would like for us to, uh, to at least be in a situation in which the timing is appropriate. And what I'll do there is I'll go back to, to uh, the circumstances involving our daughter being conceived and born, compare that to our son. I'll say, I found out that my wife was pregnant. We found out that she was pregnant. I was due to, we were both at the time due to uh, support a combat deployment in the Middle East in six weeks. So of course, we wouldn't have wanted uh, that was obviously not the best time around. Compare that to to our son. When he was born, there were discussions there and we at least planned a lot more methodically. So I would like what I would like to do there is there were there was improvement done between our son and our daughter. So what I would like for us to do, if and when we're blessed with the third, I would like for the timing to be even more appropriate, more sufficient in comparison to when our son was born uh, four years ago. That's just one of those things that when people ask those things, and I love to use self-disclosure, of course, when it's appropriate, when it's uh, when it correlates with what we're discussing during an individual, like a couple's, a family, or a group counseling session, when it correlates with their respective treatment planning, I like to use that self-disclosure just perhaps so they can see things from a different perspective. A lot of people who allow me to provide these services for them, they see a lot of the same things. Let's just have you know, four or five, six children. Nothing wrong with that, but is the timing appropriate? Probably not. Is the man going to be involved? And I always tell people, well, let's at least think about, be honest with yourself. Is this something, at least right now, of course things could change, but is this something that's going to be stable and be honest with yourself? Is this someone I'm just having fun with for in the interim? Or is this someone that I can actually visualize us intertwining our lives together? If the answer is yes, then good luck to you. If the answer is perhaps maybe one day in the near future, then it's probably not if you're being wholeheartedly honest with yourself. And this is where I wanted to transition into children learning forms of criminality from their parents. So here's what I'm talking about. Me growing up in inner city, West Philadelphia, in Southwest Philadelphia, a lot of my counterparts I'm talking about as young as eight years old. When I was that young, they knew how to to break into homes. They knew how to steal cars. They knew how to properly utilize drug paraphernalia to engage in recreational substance abuse. And I would ask, where did you learn this? You didn't learn it from us because we don't know. You didn't learn it from your peers. We don't learn this at school, obviously. So where did you learn how to do this? And they would say, uncle such and such, auntie such and such. They would say my mother. They would say my father. So it was very, uh, it was always very scary because of course when my household, uh, I knew that my mother and my stepfather would, would even, uh, if they didn't support that, they wouldn't uh, encourage that type of behavior. And, and of course, they wouldn't teach that type of behavior, not being judgmental towards anyone because we're all different. I work with a lot of people who uh, who are involved currently, and they'll share with me that they, they'll teach their child or children various forms of criminality. I would talk with someone, and he or she would share with me that they've taught their son how to break apart a weapon, how to clean it properly, how to put it back together, how to load a magazine, how to uh, chamber a round, how to take a weapon off, how to take the safety off, how to point, how to shoot. And we're not talking about for self-defense purposes because all else failed as far as the various lines of defense within the household or within the family. They're talking about to commit armed robbery. So here's what I'll share. I'll talk about my experiences as an adult with the United States Army. And I will talk about, I've met a lot of people who will exercise their Second Amendment rights as far as the Constitution of the United States of America regarding bearing arms. And I say, I know a lot of people who carry weapons around in places they probably don't have to. And I'm talking about a grocery store. So what I'll present to them. And I'll also say, if you're going to a grocery store in which you have to carry a weapon to, you should probably go to a different grocery store if you're able to do so, because we shouldn't have to be worried about uh, needing a weapon just to go grocery shopping. But I do know people who will carry their weapon around with them no matter where they go. 
and they will literally sleep with their weapon under their pillow for various reasons. So I'll say, so your child is taught to perpetrate armed robbery. What happens? And I'll give them two scenarios. I'll say, what happens if your child approaches someone and this person of course, feel threatened and now have the legal right because they've been threatened with a weapon. This person reaches into their back pocket or wherever their weapon's holstered and they shoot your child and this is a fatal shooting. What happens there? And I'll say, no matter what you say, as far as your retaliation or your decision-making subsequently following, it was a fatal shooting and your child is gone. All because of what? Because you wanted your child to learn various forms of property and violent crimes to potentially help support the household financially, which is predominantly why I'm told by these parents that they teach their child their child or children various forms of criminality. So here's where I'll toss things back. We're gonna take an 11 year old child. This child brandishes a weapon. Circumstances take place during this, during this situation. The child shoots the victim and the victim dies. So now this is a lose-lose situation for everyone. Does a child go to a juvenile correctional facility until 18 years old or 21 years old and then set free? There's going to be backlash there. Does this child go to prison for life or if we're in a state of capital punishment? Potentially even there be conversations about that. There's lose-lose there. Now we're talking about the victim. The victim's life is gone. The victim's family have to deal with all that. All because of what? Maybe $36.27 that the victim had on his or her person. What would that money really have done? Probably not much. And that's when I bring things back into, these things are being taught to children to help support the household financially. But if we just would have been a little more methodical, been a little more patient, we wouldn't be in a household as far as with a single parent with four or five, six, seven hungry children, unfortunately. So now, rather than thinking, okay, what can I do from a pro-social law abiding perspective to provide and support financially, I'm going to teach these children how to engage in criminality where those circumstances would happen. So the last, the last hypothetical circumstance that I just provided, I'll say, what if that happens with your child? What if your child now must live with the realization that, that they took someone's life over maybe 30 bucks that's on their person? I say, how would you handle that? What would that do to your child emotionally and psychologically? And that's what I wanted to, uh, toss things to you. Parents out there who are purposely teaching their children how to engage in various forms of criminality just to help support their household, what will we recommend to them as far as at least getting them to hopefully consider changing their perspectives so their child or children isn't in a position to engage in something that could lead to the passing of themselves or someone else or potentially them going to prison for a very long time, if not for the remainder of their natural life. No, I would, um, I would honestly, for me, first of all, and foremost, you should never teach your child how to break the law. You should always teach your children how to be upstanding people, whether it be, you know, abiding by the law, doing right. It's you teach your children right from wrong and then teaching them to do wrong is, is not right at all. You should never teach your child that because now they're learning a set of skills and a set that they're in their mind is what's that is appropriate and it's not appropriate. I think honestly, um, the first step would be to make sure you're utilizing all appropriate avenues within your community to help support your family if you need that additional support. Are you receiving SNAP, as they call it now, or if your children are younger, are you receiving WIC? These programs provide food for your family. Are you going to food banks that are available and easy, easily accessible to, to get food for your kids? Are you looking for work no matter where it's at, what it is? Are you taking steps and moving forward for yourself as well so that way you're not stuck in a cycle of consistently doing the wrong thing as well. I think sometimes some people, they're taught that from their family, like uh, their aunt, their uncle, their parents taught them these skills so that in their mind, these are the appropriate skills to teach. And they don't quite sometimes understand that they're not because part of it is that they never got in trouble. They've never got caught doing these illegal things. So even though a small part of their mind knows that it's illegal because 
they see it in movies, they see it on TV shows, they see those people in the movies and on the TV shows being arrested for it, but they themselves have never faced consequences for doing those illegal actions. So they've constantly got away with it. So in their mind, they're gonna teach, teach their children these skills and their children are gonna get away with it. They're gonna constantly get away with it because they got away with it. The thing to remember is that there only takes that one time it only takes something to go left one time and there's a snowball effect. You're not gonna get away with it. You could harm yourself or harm someone else. And it also all, all boils down to, like I've said before, you as parents and us as adults, our job is to protect our children and make them feel safe and secure. Teaching your children to do illegal activities is not protecting your children. And that should be at the forefront of your mind. So make sure you're utilizing every avenue in, within your community to support and take care of your family before you result to illegal activities. And if it's coming down to you resulting to illegal activities, you're missing something somewhere, in my opinion. You referenced uh, access to community-oriented resources quite a few times. And actually, uh, that had triggered a... Uh, a subject that I wanted to uh, briefly discuss during our time together today. There's a woman that I wanted to present a woman. She's in her early 40s and she's actually in the process. She is pregnant currently. So this will be her first child she's ever birthed. She told me that she always wanted to be a mother, but she wanted to make sure that her life was in order before she became a mother. And these are matters that I, uh, things are going great for. I love working with her. I love talking to her. I always joke with her about about waiting so long to uh, have your first child. What she's doing, what she does professionally, she travels around the uh, state of Pennsylvania. She visits uh, women's shelters. She visits domestic violence shelters. She visits women rehabilitation centers as far as mental health as well as substance abuse. She visits uh, county jails. Speaks on the women's units. She's all about women empowerment. She's all about telling her story. She just recently completed an associate of science degree in psychology with an emphasis um, being placed on addiction and recovery. So she's doing a great job. And she always talks about wanting to become a mother when she had those achievements there because she wanted to have something to point to as far as her child and children. She told me that with her now that she's moved very deeply into sustained active recovery, her body is feeling great. And she talks about birthing a couple more children uh, during her 40s if she's able to do so. She's involved in a committed relationship and they're they're very wonderful. We meet periodically as far as couples counseling just to just to toss some ideas back and forth with each other. There's nothing of significance going on that requires it. It's just uh, all about seeing things differently. And what I do under those circumstances, I'll talk about you and I. I said, my wife and I, we've been together 16 years, married for 13 years. And I say, we actually, we're we're very different. I say, it's okay to be different. We don't have to agree on everything or see everything as far as, uh, okay, here's how I feel about this. If I like blue, you like blue. If you like gray, I like gray. So we don't have to like and love the same thing. We could be we could be different, but still come together and make things happen. So with them, that's what they like to come together, work on. And she always talks about whenever we have our sessions, we'll conclude. Maybe she'll send me a voicemail or leave me a voicemail or send me an email. She always talks about being very appreciative about the self-disclosure aspects of things because like, here's an example. They were talking about, she likes huge vehicles. She likes huge uh, automobiles. And she wanted that for their family vehicle. Her significant other was talking about, let's get a smaller or mid-sized vehicle that's four doors, still space for our family. He was talking about saving money on gasoline and maintenance. He was being proactive as far as thinking about that. She wasn't too concerned about that. She said, here's what I like here and this and that. So what I talked about there is that's totally fine. You like your big trucks. He prefers, he doesn't have a preference, but he prefers something more cost effective. You all could meet in the middle there or you all could compromise maybe somewhere else. Is there some money that could be freed up here and there? And they actually use that. They do smoke cigarettes very heavily. They say, you know what we can do because he's worried about the gasoline and maintenance they had decided to work on smoking cessation. And what they're doing there is they're working towards reducing the amount of uh, cigarettes that they smoke. They can save money there. She can get the vehicle that she's happy with. And also they're doing something that's going to be uh, advantageous for all. 
I just wanted to share there because we're talking about resources. And she said, most importantly, community oriented resources. She says she didn't want to have a child and have to worry about diaper banks, food banks, financial assistance and things like that. She said, I wanted to have a child and be able to support it without the need of relying upon assistance because she says she's seen people go through those proceedings and then all of a sudden, boom, a program lost funding and is closed. She was talking about, she gave an example and I knew about this organization. She said a lot of her associates several years ago were going to this location on Wednesdays. There was a diaper bank and she said out of nowhere, they lost funding or whatever happened, they were closed. She said she didn't want to be in that type of situation where she's going to a location to grab something and then it's no longer there. So now it's like, okay, what do I do? I didn't have any warning. So she had talked about not wanting to lean upon resources. I thought that was very powerful. So I wanted to toss at you, what stands in people's way as far as sitting back, being patient and being methodical as far as not even just starting a family, but expanding upon a family? Why are we as a society in such a rush, particularly when we know that we have these signs, we have X, we have Y, we have Z. We have all this in front of us that's telling us that we should at least sit back and give it several months, perhaps even a year or two. Why is that so problematical for us as a society as a whole? You know, in my, um, this, again, this is just my personal opinion. I think we as a society are very selfish. Like, uh, you know that there's instances going on around you that don't make having another child or ex- like having other instances that the the things around you are not appropriate at the time you know that you're not sustaining yourself by yourself you know that you're using a lot of either illegal activities or a lot of community services there's nothing wrong with getting help occasionally but if you're consistently living off of it without doing anything for yourself that's when it's time to do a self-reflection you know everyone everyone is different everyone needs help everyone needs assistance that's every human being ever, no one can ever do everything on their own. That it's just something we all as a society need to accept. We learn to learn how to accept a little assistance but not rely on assistance. And the thing of it is, is that people get in their minds that I want this and I want this now. It doesn't matter about anything else. It's just about that want for them. And I believe we as a society need to do a lot more self-reflecting and a lot more looking within ourselves and looking and to determine if what we want is truly what one, what truly what we want and two, what we need. You know, like at this moment in time, you don't necessarily need to have another child if you already have three or four. It's okay to say you want another one and you think that it would be a good idea, but if you sit down and you seriously take a look at everything that's going on, are you, ha- do you have enough time for the ones you have? Are you running around a lot? Do you have, are you so dead tired at the end of the night from doing everything that you just cannot function? It's okay to say, I want it, but I don't, I want, I want this, but I just cannot do this. It's okay to say that. I think a lot of people, they tell themselves that they have to do it and you don't have to do anything. In that instance, in that type of situation, you don't have to have a child. It's okay to say, I'll wait, I'll get this stuff together. Let me, let me get these two completely situated and settled and get them moving forward to where they don't need it. They'll always need you, your kids will always need you, but they won't need me as much. Then, then we can have another one. The first thing I wanted to address, you may mention of time. At the time of this recording, we're actually about we're, well, we're actually one week away from packing up the family and taking a trip across several states in support of our daughter attending a uh, basketball camp that's going to be hosted, or I'm not sure of the uh, terminology, but the Charlotte Hornets will be affiliated with this basketball camp. This is going to take place during Father's Day weekend, and I'm already a very proud father. This weekend has not come yet, but I'm, it's already a very wonderful Father's Day weekend for me, and we're still a week away from that. Well, you mentioning time. We're, we're taking this trip. We're packing up the family. Everyone's going. That's just all the time, all the money, all the food, everything that's going to be, uh, that's going to happen that weekend. That's all 
for one child. When we, uh, when I received notification that the invitation was there for her to attend this basketball camp, I probably told everyone I talked to, I'm probably going to uh, continue telling everyone I speak with, regardless of the facet between now and then. And I'm pretty certain that this will continue immediately following the camp. Whenever I'm working, I'm talking to someone in a professional setting, I'll share that story with them. And then I'll say to them, why did I just share with you that uh, my family and I were going, we're going to travel across several states to take our daughter to a basketball camp? And oh, by the way, this camp is, it's a one day camp. It's uh, very cost effective, but it's going to be a great opportunity. I'll share with them, why am I telling you this? Because you're not interested in basketball. Your children are not interested in basketball. So why am I telling you this? I want to see if they know where I'm going. I particularly ask people whom I've been working with for a very long time, and the vast majority of them know why. They say, oh, you're not showing off. We know what you're doing is you're reminding me of how much time that one child needs in particular. So we have multiple. In our case, we have two. And I'm still trying to uh, get some things figured out. What can we do? For our son, obviously he's too young to be involved with that particular camp. So what can we do for him? Because we don't want to leave him, you know, out just hanging out there. We want to make sure that there's, we want to make sure that he's prioritized as well, that he feels as though that he's important too, that we plan for him as well to, ha you know, have some sort of enjoyment, even though that the predominant reasoning for this trip is for his older sister. I'm talking to them about it being very important for us to remain mindful of how much time each individualized child needs, how those relationships need to be nourished as far as father, daughter, father, son, father, son, father, son, father, daughter, and then again, mother, daughter, mother, son, mother, son, and so on and so forth. We have those individualized relationships with our children, and then we have that collective relationship with our children. We have mother, child, father, child, and then we have mother, children, father, children, and then we have family. I like to remind people of all of those unique relationships and dynamics that are taking place under, under uh, each household and also keeping in mind all the time that's needed. And we only have 24 hours in the day. You also referenced assistance. And with assistance, that was a great segue into perhaps our final subject for this particular episode. We're talking about particularly single, single parents needing assistance wherever it can come from. I wanted to present a woman. This woman is 26 years old, five children. Unfortunately, in the type of situation that she's involved in, we have five children, five different men. None of these men are involved in any manner, no support whatsoever. So she does, and I always empathize with her. I do understand the unique situation that she's in. I do understand the emotional toll that this could take. So what happens here is, she will accept babysitting or financial assistance from anyone who will provide. But what I wanted to share with you, we're talking about a neighborhood friend. This neighborhood friend is allowed to verbally, physically discipline her children. And of course, being non-judgmental, I knew about this in the past. Recently, I asked her about it. I said, what? And I said, teach me something. Why do we allow a neighborhood friend to verbally and physically discipline each of your children. The response I'll receive is something along the lines of, this is an adult, they're children. So I gave her the uh, green light to do so. So I'll say to her, I say, okay, well, as far as uh, just for self-disclosure purposes, I say the only people who have that privilege, and I'm using that privilege because our children are very special to us, have that privilege as far as my family would be myself and my wife. And I said, I do understand that this neighborhood friend, potentially maybe you look at as a loved one that's just not related genetically. Maybe your children view this person as an aunt, but now we're talking about, we're talking about uh, profanity. We're talking about voice raising. We're talking about paddling. We're talking about whoopers with belts. I said, is that something that, that should be allowed by a neighborhood friend? I'm just, what I'm doing here is, of course, just, I just want to get a better understanding of the dynamic. And she had shared with me that, you know, she doesn't have the time to do so. So I said, so why give that? So do we have to discipline in that particular manner? I said, could we, could we just engage in dialogue? Could we communicate? 
could we hug? Could we do something differently rather than allowing a neighborhood friend to engage in, in physical abuse? And what I wanted to toss at you, and this will probably be our last uh, subject for this particular episode, what is it that as far as people, and of course, everyone's different, households are different, dynamic, family dynamics are different. What do you feel as though allows people to give non-relatives the green light to verbally and physically discipline their children? Uh, you know, this is something different for me because I've never experienced it in any way, shape or form or in personal experience, heard of it. Um, you know, when I was a kid, my best friend, her mom, like if we got in trouble at her mom's house, her mom and her mom grounded her and I was part of it. Her mom was allowed to ground me, but she had a conversation with my mom. I think honestly, like the, as far as like disciplining your children, I truly believe that's nothing that should, that's not something that should be done outside of your family, especially as form of like physical discipline. Um, like if you're, if your best, your child's best friend, mom, best friend's mother has them sit in timeout because they were roughhousing and not listening. That's different. If they are, they break something in the home. So they both get grounded for a day or two. That's different. Allowing someone to come in and physically hit your child, yell at your child and curse at your child is not something I personally believe in. I don't think, um, I don't think that's something that should be done. Um, because of the simple fact that you're, in a way, you're allowing this person to teach your child that strangers can do this to them. That it's okay for strangers to hit them. It's okay for strangers to call them out their name. It's okay for strangers to yell at them for no reason. It's not a lesson that you should teach your children. You know, if the person you're having watch your kid, if they say that they did something wrong, then you as their parent should address it with them. You know, timeouts are okay. They Timeouts are used in, in daycares and schools and stuff like that and things along those lines, but to physically hit, hit someone else's child and to verbally abuse someone else's child, I, I personally don't think any parent should ever allow that to happen um, because like I said, you're allowing your child to be taught that it's okay for strangers to do this to you and it's not okay. I think that's, those are very far powerful points and a great way to bring this episode to an end. So this will conclude this episode of the Dr. and Mrs. Curry podcast. Mrs. Curry and I genuinely hope that you found the information informative and that either you or someone you know benefit from this platform. If so, think about liking and sharing this video. If you have not already done so, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, which is Dr. Joshua John Curry, EDD, and hit that notification bell so you could be notified when videos and presentations have been uploaded. In addition to our parenting-related podcast, there is a chemical dependency-related relapse prevention podcast and multi-systemic presentations that our organization put together and upload to YouTube. Whenever you have time, visit our website, www.drcurryandassociates.com, which will connect you to our company, Dr. Curry and Associates. Look into viewing and following us on Twitter, our Twitter handle is at Dr. Joshua Curry. Thank you for taking part in this episode, and we will catch you the next time around.